passionate about the subject, from talking to his students, I know his enthusiasm is contagious. Taylor is definitely a bright light in the Thank you. Once again, uh, my name is Taylor Tiratira, and thank you for coming down uh, to this special community lecture here for Sierra College. And as many of you are aware, the topic for tonight is the 1980s. Now, a couple of notes before we get started here. First of all, to some extent, our time limits are arbitrary. I was actually explaining this to uh, some of my students in my European history class the other day. If you want to call a certain century in European history the 1800s, 1815 to 1914 would work way better than 1800 to 1900. So sometimes when you try to squeeze certain time periods into one decade, uh, it doesn't quite fit together. So there are a lot of concepts we'll be talking about today, which started well before the 1980s, which are going to continue well after the 1980s. But nonetheless, if you look at this from the right perspective, there are some really serious cultural and political trends which begin in the 1980s and still have a lot of resonance for our present culture. So, oh, and one other note, uh, I decided to get really fancy for you guys tonight and did one of the only, uh, my only experiments with PowerPoint. So I think I've got the hang of this. If I fumble around, apologies in advance, but we will recover. I first, I first wanted to ask you guys, a lot of you uh, probably do not remember the 1980s much. I only remember the tail end of the 1980s myself, but many of you I'm sure have some very vivid memories of the 1980s. Are there any major events that you know you remember in the 1980s which still stick out in your mind? Does anyone want to volunteer that information? Yes? John Lennon died. John Lennon died in 1980. At the age of only 40, he was assassinated. I was not going to talk about that, but that is an excellent event to bring up right there. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, Arka. AIDS. Uh, yes. And actually, the AIDS crisis was one of the defining national health crises of the 1980s, and that also had political implications. We'll see if we have time to address that tonight. Yes? Well, I'm German, so at the end of that decade, of course, the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. There's no way you can end a decade on the 80s, a, a lecture about the 80s decade without having a picture of the Berlin Wall, so we will have a picture of that. Uh, and yes, go ahead. Uh, the Iran hostage that started in 79, but very late in 79. Yes, the Iranian hostage crisis, which drags on into the 1980s and has huge political implications. I'll take a couple more. Yeah. Incredible inflation and um, interest rates for homes. Which yeah. Went yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. especially in the early part of the 1980s. That was actually a direct response by the feds to try to get that inflationary spiral under control. It caused a lot of short-term economic misery for the American people. Anyone else? I'll take one more. Yeah. Challenger explosion. Challenger, yes. And that was an event which burned into the minds of many people who lived through that in the 1980s. And it also was an event that caused a lot of deep thinking amongst the American people. Oh, yes, you have one more? Yeah. Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl. And you can kind of connect Chernobyl to the Challenger as well. Uh, so I realize you guys could do this forever. So I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll tell you one of the uh, incidents I saw. One of the things I saw online recently uh, which inspired me to do this lecture. I don't know if anyone, let me turn off one of the lights here. I don't know if anyone is going to recognize what this is a picture of here. Does, does anyone know what that's up right there? Uh, oh, yes, sir. He-Man Castle Grayskull. Now, why in, the world is, why in the world are we starting off with a picture of this? Well, 80s nostalgia is a very powerful trend that you see in culture today. It's kind of funny when I talk to people who lived through the 80s, they can't believe that newer generations see the 80s as some distant decade. But this is a great example of this. When I was a kid, and I don't know how to right now, but when I was a kid, I played with He-Man Castle Grayskull. And I have no idea where mine is anymore. Uh, I'm sure it's in some landfill somewhere. I wish I knew where mine was right now because I was, uh, I read this article the other day 
This castle is selling on eBay now in mint condition for $8,300. So, people will pay a lot of money to relive the experiences of their past. And that's also a nice message for the rest of you. Save your children's toys. You're, you never know when these things are going to be worth a fortune. So clearly, 80s nostalgia has become a powerful force in our culture. So what is it, and let me get one of my lights back on here, what is it that people uh, kind of remember today about the 1980s? Well, the 1980s are generally remembered by the American people as a good time period. It begins in a really bad state in the beginning of the 1980s. Then we see economic recovery. We see an explosion of this fun, loving, consumption type of culture. Many people love the styles, the, musics of the, the music of the 1980s. They have really good memories of this decade. But there are also a lot of people who really criticize some of the major American developments we've seen over the course of this decade. So let's start with a little bit of a background here. There's no better way to talk about this transition between the 1970s and the 1980s than these two men right here. And I'm sure most of you recognize who these two men are. Who's that man on the left right there? That was President Jimmy Carter, who was president from 77 to 81. And this man, of course, is Ronald Reagan, who was president from 81 to 89. The American people, at the beginning of the 1980s, felt very bad about where they were going and very uncertain about their future. The economy was in a severely unstable state. There, were, there was this uh, wave of inflation which was causing economic misery for the American people at the end of the 1970s. Why this was happening is something you have to take my modern history classes to get all the details of. But this definitely was a trend that was really causing the American people to wonder, are our best days behind us, basically? Uh, have we reached our peak as a global power, and is there any way out of this economic spiral? Some people believe today that President Carter was an underrated president, especially based on his, economic, on his environmental policy. But one thing Carter was definitely terrible at was assuring the American people that better days lay ahead. People generally saw Carter as this Debbie Downer type of president, constantly telling the American people what was wrong with them, what we were doing wrong. This new president, who inspires this generation coming of age in the 1980s, he promises that there is a way out of this economic mess. Now, what he does in order to try to uh, change the structure of the country is very much open for debate. We'll talk about that in just a second. But when Reagan here buries Jimmy Carter in his re-election campaign in 1980, there's this general sense that there is now a shift between the pessimistic, very rational global view of Jimmy Carter and the more optimistic, we can go out there and get this done and exert our power attitude of Ronald Reagan. And so, one of the very first things I wanted to begin this lecture with was a discussion of the legacy of Reagan. Because when you ask people to remember the 80s, very few people can think of the 80s without Ronald Reagan popping into their heads at one point or another. Now, let's talk a little bit about your memories of Reagan. Uh, just, uh, you know, from what you remember seeing him on TV, hearing him talk to the American people, does anyone have any specific memories of Reagan here? Or, yes, yeah. The Berlin War. Uh, uh, yeah, and actually someone mentioned that earlier. Uh, we will talk about the Berlin Wall. And uh, what was that famous phrase that Reagan used uh, a couple years before the wall came down? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Yes, yeah, so we'll ho uh, hopefully get to that by the end of class today. Any other like memories of Reagan just burned in your head? Yes? Wasn't he a like, uh, really good face on TV? Like, people recognized his face. Does anyone know what one of Reagan's nicknames was? The Great Communicator. Reagan 
was a natural on TV. He was great at communicating visually with the American people. Maybe no surprise. After all, it was his first profession. He was an actor. He was a natural at this. Yes. Any other uh, memories burned in your head around Reagan? Yes, Reagan. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is it? Deregulation? Yes. His famous concept of what they call Reaganomics, which is a combination of supply side economics and deregulation. We'll talk a little bit about both of those. Anything else pop in your head when you think of Reagan? So, yes. He was a disillusioned Democrat. And yes, he started out as, as a New Deal Democrat. He eventually abandoned the Democrats in the 50s and the 60s. Instead, he ended up becoming an icon of the Republican Party. Now, once again, there's only so much time I have to go into his background and his transition here. But Reagan came in with this completely new philosophy of running the government. And he has a major impact on the way that the government conducts itself in the future. In what way? Well, he certainly has a permanent impact on the tax structure of the country. What you're seeing here is a visual representation of the income tax rate in the United States over the course of 100 years. You'll notice it starts out pretty high. This is the progressive era. It goes to rock bottom in the 20s. The depression, many people feel, undermine the economic policies of the 20s. So you get huge tax rates on the wealthy in the New Deal era. These largely remain in place up until the end of the 1970s. Then you get a crash in tax rates across the country uh, with the beginning of the Reagan era. And they've gone up slightly since that time period. Uh, right now, they're more right about here. But they're still nowhere near the level where they were at for much of the 20th century. Reagan believed that you had to cut the taxes, in particular, of upper-class Americans because they were the job creators of the country. They were the ones who were building businesses and hiring people, so these were the people who deserved a financial break. So that's one major part of Reagan's economic policy. Another major part is deregulation. And actually, some of you may remember what that whole concept was all about. Does anyone know what deregulation was all about? Anyone who's not in my history class right now know what deregulation is all about? Yes. Um, he um, cut back on regulations that were uh, and, and rules to get businesses started. Mm -hmm. So you, like, it, it had disastrous effects on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Well, and the legacy of deregulation, Reagan felt that the federal government was too much in the way of people building businesses and hiring people, and excessive regulation was the wrong way to go. He wanted to get the government out of this process. Now, what was the legacy of Reaganomics? If you don't believe the politics of the 80s are you know, relevant to today, just listen to people debate the legacy of Reaganomics. On the one hand, the tax cuts look like a huge success in that the 80s then see a big period of economic growth. So you start out in the early 80s, the economy is just in the tank. There's a massive period of economic growth throughout the 1980s. On the other hand, Reagan assured the American people these tax cuts would pay for themselves. We ended up spiraling into massive deficit spending over the course of the 1980s. So many economists felt that his promise on that was far over Reagan. So we still really debate the legacy of Reaganomics and whether this was the right thing to do. Hence why one of the big differences today between the Republican and the Democratic Party is what exactly should the tax rates be of both ordinary and wealthy Americans. That's still something that no one can agree on. Now, uh, I'm going to jump into some more topics here. Did you guys have any questions or thoughts about some of these debates over the legacies of Reaganomics here? So you have this controversy over Reaganomics, and you also mentioned the controversy over deregulation. Uh, and here actually is where Reagan has a big impact, which I think a lot of you guys would not be aware of. Reagan believes 
that especially in terms of environmental protection, the less the government is involved in that, the better. And he says basically the people who should run the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, should be the lumber and mining and oil and, tip and uh, those types of interests because those are the businesses who know what they're doing in terms of environmental regulations. <laughs> Reagan severely slashes any national support for the environmental movement. And this actually puts the environmental movement in a transition period, which we're still living with the legacy of today. Prior to Reagan, the environmental movement is this kind of national ground up type, you know, like uh, you have these 250,000 people protest demanding one environmental law or another. With this pullback of the federal government in favor of environmentalism, suddenly the environmental movement becomes much more regionally centered. It becomes much more locally centered. People start to kind of break away from these big national organizations, and they start to focus on environmental issues in their own communities. So this takes the environmental movement away from nationalism and more in the direction of this state and local type of activism. And we're still living with that legacy today. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the major environmental groups uh, that are active in and around Truckee and this area of Northern California. Many of these groups are focusing exclusively on local issues. This is a trend which really escalates beginning in the 1980s. So in a way, this has an impact on the national environmental movement, which is totally accidental. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts about that entire topic right there? No? Uh, by the way, uh, what, what are some of the major local environmental groups? I know, let's see, there's, I know the American River Conservancy is around here. Any other big ones? Watershed Council? Say again? The Truckee River Watershed Council. Yeah, any others you can think of? Truckee Darn Land Trust. Truckee Darn Land Trust, yes. And once again, these are mainly local groups that you're thinking of. Yeah, I'm sure there are Greenpeace people in the area and those type of national environmental groups, but when you think about this environmental activism, you're often thinking about these local groups instead. So, let's jump to some of the other major changes in the 1980s, in particular in what you see in foreign policy. The Reagan Revolution is incredibly popular amongst the American people. It helps that there's this general feeling that the world was spiraling out of control in the 1970s. In the 1980s, it looks like America is once again becoming a global colossus. Oh, by the way, what major international conflict which started long before the 1980s, are we still right in the middle then at this point in history? The Cold War. Of course, who's the Cold War between? The United States and the Soviet Union. Well, there had been a period of what they called detente, thaw, and the Cold War in the 60s and 70s. In the 1980s, the Cold War is on again in full measure. And Reagan and his top foreign policy advisors, they have a simple philosophy in terms of dealing with communism and the Soviet Union. Their philosophy is basically support anyone around the world who is against communism. Pure and simple. It goes back to that old Truman Doctrine all the way back in the 40s. The world is divided into two sides, good and evil. You're a good anti-communist or you are an evil communist. Well, that interpretation, many people still supported in the 80s. They still, for good reason, saw the USSR as America's most dangerous enemy. However, it leads to policy, which we're still living with the consequences of today. Uh, can anyone kind of see what that's a picture of right now? What's happening here? Reagan is negotiating with, you mentioned it? The Taliban, yes. The famous Taliban resistance fighters of Afghanistan. Now, uh, many of you are probably aware of this on a basic level. 
Can, did, can anyone kind of tell me like what we're doing in Afghanistan at this point? Does anyone kind of know? Yes, go ahead. Well, we're close to the Russians. Hmm? Russians were fighting Russians. in Afghanistan. Yep, the Russians had invaded Afghanistan, trying to impose a communist government in Afghanistan, and these freedom fighters, as Reagan calls them, are resisting the growth of the Soviet Empire. So the U.S. government pumps a huge amount of aid to this Taliban government. Does, uh, you guys might not know this little detail. Does anyone know why the Taliban had rebelled against the Soviet Union in the first place? Does anyone know, like, why they started this whole resistance? Regardless? Huh? Regardless? Uh, well, uh, uh, oh yes, uh, and actually, yeah, you're on the right track there. The Soviet Union had mandated national education for girls, <laughs> and they saw that as a mammoth violation of their own society. That was what had sparked this Afghan rebellion against the Soviet Union in the first place. And this brings up a whole host of questions. We're still arguing about today. Uh, was this a good campaign, in a sense? Was this worth the investment? The Afghans defeat the Soviet Union. But Afghanistan is a war-torn country that is pretty much dominated by the end of the 1980s by groups who believe in the most brutal forms of Sharia law. And the U.S. government basically said, this isn't our problem anymore, and more or less left Afghanistan to its own devices throughout the end of the 80s and the 1990s. I'm sure you guys can make connections here to events which we're dealing with in the present day, which we're still living with the legacy of. But... That's a great question. You know what? I'm not sure who that is right there. And uh, actually, uh, what happened when I was putting this lecture together, I tried to find the best picture I could of Reagan negotiating with these Afghan leaders. And this was a great image of them all sitting around talking with each other. But I'm not entirely sure who the woman is. So every now and then, this is good, every now and then I tell my students to stump the teacher, and that is definitely a case of you guys stumping the teacher. So. Both, yeah, exactly. Uh, you're right, like a C word inclusive type of thing, maybe, yes. So, yeah, uh, any other questions or thoughts up to this point? But I'm sure you guys do remember, though, the effect that this had on 80s culture. Uh, that Cold War, which I thought in the 70s, is ice cold again in the 80s, and the Russians are the bad guys, and you see that in every element of 80s society. If you play any bad video game from the 80s, if you watch any bad, bad action flick from the 80s, who is always the villain who they're fighting at that point? The Russians. Yes, they're always the villain. And that's where uh, I accidentally went one too far, but there's the big reveal right there. Uh, has anyone ever seen this particular flick right here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, who wants to admit to watching this particular flick? Does anyone know what the general plot of this is? Well, Rambo, who is a traumatized Vietnam War veteran, he now has become a one-man killing force for the greatness of the country, and he is helping the brave freedom fighters in Afghanistan destroy this evil Soviet empire, and this is a rousing action flick when it's released in the 80s. When people watch this today, they tend to watch this with a little bit of a different eye, but I just had to throw in a Rambo picture at some point. So, uh, any other questions or thoughts up to this point? So, I wanted to go over a little bit some of these uh, political and economic controversies of the 80s because that's a great place to start. But let's start to get into fun stuff in terms of other ways the country is radically changing over the course of the 1980s. And one way is this, which we're also still living with today. This is an obsession which is consuming the national culture of the 1980s. And actually, uh, this is one Time Magazine cover. There were probably uh, about six or seven of these over the course of the 1980s. Of course, what is this obsession which is consuming national culture in the 1980s? Uh, yeah, the war on drugs, which actually was begun by Richard Nixon, but it is greatly escalated by presidents 
Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, all back to back, all of these presidents further escalate this war on drugs in the 1980s and the 1990s. And this actually brings up an interesting uh, question, which is another thing we still debate today. When Reagan takes office, the general attitude toward drug use was, you know, this is a, a personal problem of sorts. This is something which people struggle with, and you have to punish them for breaking the law, but you also have to give them the resources to kind of break this drug cycle of addiction. Reagan and these other major uh, political forces in the 80s, I mentioned Clinton, this becomes a real bipartisan effort. They basically say, no, this is a law enforcement issue.